Good morning, and welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. It's really my pleasure to introduce two of our faculty members who are providing Grand Rounds for us today. First, Jon Arneson it, uh, grew up in, on an island just south of uh, Iceland and graduated uh, from college in Reykjavik, attended the University of Iceland for his medical degree, and also took an immunology fellowship uh, there. He served as an internal medicine and surgery resident uh, before coming to the United States to join our residency, um, where he undertook internal medicine residency and then fellowship in rheumatology. He became an internist and rheumatologist affiliated with the university in Portage initially and was a an clinical assistant professor until 2002. He went back and practiced in Iceland and we were delighted to recruit him back to the University of Wisconsin in 2010. Uh, first as a uh, clinical assistant professor and now as clinical associate professor. He is renowned as one of our outstanding clinicians and also an excellent and active educator uh, teaching at the student level and currently with residents and fellows in the rheumatology clinic. Our other speaker today is um, uh, Kevin McCown, his division head. Uh, Kevin is a graduate of Michigan State University and then Wayne State University for his medical degree. He took a, uh, uh, an internship in internal medicine at Wayne State for one year and then served as a primary care officer uh, for the Navy aboard ships for much of that time for four years prior to returning for his uh, completion of uh, residency, this time at the University of Tennessee. He undertook rheumatology fellowship there and joined the faculty. He ascended through the ranks to associate professor with tenure at the University of Tennessee uh, before being recruited in 2001, along with his wife to uh, the University of Wisconsin, where he first served as an associate professor of uh, medicine in CHS, also was co-director for the medicine clerkship and co-chief of the rheumatology division. His current role is professor of medicine, he's head of rheumatology, and is program director for the fellowship program. Kevin has um, published uh, 32 papers and chapters. He's been very active in education, as I already mentioned. He's very active nationally among the various organizations, the American Board of Internal Medicine, the American College of Physicians, American College of Rheumatology, uh, the AAMC, among others. He's received a number of awards along the way. Um, he received a, Naval, a Navy Achievement Medal, uh, as well as um, a number of awards from our department, including uh, the Department of Medicine's um, Graham Meyer Teaching Award for Excellence for Teaching Residents and Fellows, uh, the UW Dean's Teaching Award, the Department of Medicine Schilling Harkness Teaching Award for Excellence in Teaching Medical Students. He's listed in Best Doctors in America, and in 2014, our uh, uh, medical students elected him to AOA. Today, we're really privileged to have uh, Drs. Um, Arneson and McCown provide Medicine Grand Rounds entitled Diet, Drugs, and Steel Rheumatology Update for the Internist. Please welcome these individuals. Dr. Page, thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, happy to see all of you here this morning, and um, you and I are very um, delighted to update you on some of the things that we think are uh, most exciting and of interest to internists. I do have one financial disclosure for a patent, but it um, relates to scleroderma, and so it's not going to be the subject of uh, anything I'm going to talk about today. And here are my objectives for the, my portion of the talk. And actually, most of my talk is going to be about gout, um, something which uh, I know most of you actually already know a lot about. Um, however, there is some new information in gout. And beyond that, um, gout is becoming a more and more um, common problem. It's something that it turns out we don't treat very well, despite the fact that we do have effective therapies. You can see the prevalence uh, is increasing throughout the Western world. And in the U.S., hospitalization rates have doubled in the last 20 years. There are actually um, very good effective evidence-based guidelines that have been put up by a number of organizations 
Uh, despite that, however, uh, most patients in the U.S. and in Europe are not on effective therapy. And of those who are on uh, what should be effective therapy, most of them are not at their uh, treatment goals. So we're going to kind of talk, talk about why that is and what we can do about it. So we'll just start out with the patient. Um, here's a 68-year-old comes in with a second episode of a painful swollen forefoot. Onset was very abrupt. Episode lasts for about five days. Um, the previous episode now came in um, your exam. There's redness, swelling. Um, you think, gosh, this sounds like gout. Got an x-ray. Doesn't really show anything. Routine labs are, are pretty much as you might expect in a patient like this. So, um, if I can have brave individuals raise their hands, who thinks this patient has gout? Okay. Who thinks this patient, if you don't, don't want to commit to that, how about who thinks they probably have gout? Even more, okay. So, you know, I think the, the different degrees of certainty um, can matter when you're thinking about treatment. So, you can be less certain, I think, if you're going to be treating acutely. What you want to be more certain in, in the situation where you're going to commit somebody to a lifelong course of medication that uh, has some potential dangers, um, you want to know that the, the uh, benefits are going to outweigh the risk. So we, we may need to have a different standard of certainty for that uh, cro starting chronic therapy. So what are our diagnostic options? Well, clearly, if fluid is available, that's the best option. It's got excellent sensitivity. It's the gold standard as far as specificity. Um, it's going to rule out infection. But there are instances where we can't get fluid, like for instance in the midfoot. Typically, you're not going to be able to get fluid. Um, sometimes patients will not allow you to get fluid. Um, so what are our options if, if we can't get fluid? If they've had a previous history of uric acid stone, that, that alone says that they have gout. Um, if they've had a calcium stone along with hyperuric acuria, um, many gout experts would say you should treat that patient with urate lowering therapy as well. A newer option on the scene is ultrasound. Um, ultrasound actually looks pretty good, um, but like ultrasound everywhere, it's very operator dependent. And again, it's going to depend on the availability uh, locally, how expert your, your ultrasonographer is. There are some questions about specificity. There are some of the signs which were thought to be pretty specific for gout. Now, some people say it may actually just be um, something that could be seen in pseudogout as well, which is obviously an important differential. Dual energy CT is um, another new method that we can try to make a diagnosis. Basically, they use two different energies of CT, run it through a software program, and at least in locally, you get a, a bright green picture, very, very dramatic if the patient has gout. Um, unfortunately, it's expensive. Again, problems with availability. And actually here uh, at UW, they've stopped doing it because they, our radiologists were not convinced that their software is, is uh, really specific enough. So in some cases, we're, we're left with clinical uh, decision making. And it may be, uh, particularly with, in consultation with the patient, that you say, gosh, you know, you've had this midfoot pain, really seems like gout. Um, you know, do we, do we want to treat on urate lowering therapy without that gold standard evidence? Um, you know, I think that's a conversation we have to have with patients, but there, there is now something that can help us in our clinical decision making, and that is there are some clinical algorithms. And I'm going to show you one that is actually available online and has been tested um, in a reference population of gout patients and seems to have high sensitivity and specificity. So I'm going to kind of walk through a series of screenshots from this online gout calculator, which I think, again, plays sort of a niche role um, at least in my practice, in people, people where I just can't get that diagnosis any other way. I'm pretty sure they have it, and it just kind of buttresses my uh, confidence in my uh, clinical decision-making. So if you want to find this, all you have to do is Google in Gout Calculator, and you'll come up to this website. It's the University of Auckland in New Zealand, um, although the guidelines are joint guidelines that, were, that this is based upon was... Uh, derived by the American College of Rheumatology and the European League Against uh, uh, Rheumatism. 
And the first thing they'll ask you is, do they have at least one painful swollen joint? If you say no, they're going to say, what are you doing here? Um, the next question is, um, do they have monosodiumuric crystals in the synovial fluid? And again, if you say yes, they will say, this patient has gout, don't proceed any further. But let's just kind of walk through our patient. Um, we're going to look at uh, the pattern of joint involvement. So he's got midfoot. Now we're going to look at the characteristics. And again, this is where that sort of clinical acumen has been kind of broken down. And um, they've actually assigned values to each of the questions that we're going to ask. So our patient had erythema, couldn't uh, bear to touch it or put pressure on it, great difficulty walking. So our patient had three characteristics. Time course is very important. So crystalline arthritis, typically abrupt onset, and um, at least in the early stages of um, uh, gout, you'll have this resolution of symptoms without any treatment and complete resolution between episodes. So our, our patient fit all those they had uh, two recurrent typical episodes. No evidence of TOFI. Serum urate we did get. Remember, it was a little bit high, although um, probably the lab would have said it was in the normal range. It was, I think, 7.1. Um, probably not the best timing to get it because we know that during acute attacks, um, about 30% of the time, you'll actually see a lowering of the serum urate level, but that's, that's what we have to work with, so we'll add that in. Um, has synovial fluid analysis ever been done? So clearly, if you had this patient and it had been done and it was negative, that's actually going to reduce the probability of gout um, using this uh, calculator. But that had not been done. Ask about ultrasound, uh, dual energy CT. No, we did do imaging, um, but it didn't show anything other than maybe some osteoarthritis. And actually, a little pop-up came up telling us what we should be looking for. So what this tells us is if we were going to be putting this person into a clinical trial or a clinical study of gout, they would qualify because they have a score of eight. Um, do I feel more confident now in my clinical judgment? Maybe. Um, certainly I think I'd be at a point in this patient who's already got some chronic kidney disease, recurrent episodes, that I would at least have a conversation about starting urate-lowering therapy, going through the pros and cons. So let's step back and think about um, what we should do for people with gout. Um, maybe he doesn't want to start medicine, or even if he does, I think we always need to think about other types of dietary lifestyle modifications. One of the reasons for this is that, as I think everybody here knows, the majority of people who have gout also have other cardiovascular disease, risk factors, very high prevalence of um, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, coronary disease, kidney disease. I think you could argue that the, really the role for modifying um, diet in these patients and the lifestyle modifications really is more to address their cardiovascular risk factors than the benefits that are going to accrue in terms of the gout. But having said that, there are some things that have been recommended. These um, recommendations that I have listed here come from the Ameri uh, 2012 ACR guidelines on treatment of gout. Avoiding organ meats. I, I've yet to meet anybody whose gout was based upon organ meat consumption, but um, high fructose corn syrup is, is a new one for me since medical school. Many of you are probably familiar with it, but you know this is a ubiquitous sweetener, and fructose does seem to really uh, ramp up uh, serum urate levels. Uh, we want them to limit red, wheat, uh, red meat, um, sweet fruit juices, sugary foods, alcohol, of course. Weight loss if obese, because BMI tracks very closely with, or I should say uric acid levels track very closely with uh, BMI. We want them to exercise, again, primarily for the cardiovascular benefits, but um, there are actually, um, I say possible anti-inflammatory benefits. There are clear biochemical anti-inflammatory benefits of exercise. The clinical relevance I don't think has been proven yet, but it's still a, a good suggestion for these folks. Smoking sensation, again, primarily because of the cardiovascular uh, risk. Sodium intake, these guidelines recommended low sodium intake. I put the question mark here because um, that has recently been questioned by a, a study um, that just came out in December in a &R. Uh, This was a group of uh, patients who were um, not gout patients, um, not necessarily patients with hyperuricemia. They, they had prehypertension or stage one hypertension they were controlled to either the DASH, or they were put on the DASH diet or an American diet. 
and there was a crossover trial. They tried to keep the body weight constant so that that was not going to affect uh, urate levels. And what they found was that overall the DASH diet did um, significantly but only slightly reduce serum uh, urate levels. In um, people who had elevated serum urate levels, the, the decrease was, was larger and more significant. Um, however, surprisingly, they found that actually low sodium increased serum urate levels and high sodium tended to decrease them. So I think it's a little unsettled what to do with the sodium part of things. Um, I think, again, it would probably be driven more by their uh, cardiovascular status and, and whether they have hypertension. The da- uh, for all the internists I know are very familiar with the DASH diet, but for the rheumatologist in the room, the DASH diet emphasizes whole grains, fruits, vegetables, and low-fat dairy. So dairy, I know, gets a lot of knocks, but um, here's, a, here's a thing where uh, dairy is definitely seems to be uh, beneficial. So one of the problems of gout is just that there's so much of it and it's increasing. And why is it increasing? Uh, we think it's primarily because of BMI of Americans is increasing. Um, Americans in general don't have a diet that looks like the DASH diet. Um, if we were to really turn this around and prevent gout, we would need to probably um, work on these areas primarily. Um, certainly, chronic kidney disease itself is, is a higher risk factor for developing hyperuricemia of gout than either BMI or diet. Um, but, um, you know, obviously that's a little more complex as far as preventing that. So let's go back to our patient. Um, we're going to have this conversation about um, whether they want to start urate lowering therapy at this point. We have to kind of go through the evidence that we have, the pros and cons, since it's not a slam dunk diagnosis, I think. Um, but there's some questions we have to go through, ask ourselves, um, are there medications that, that might be raising the serum urate level? Maybe we don't need to start a urate lowering therapy. Maybe we just could stop a medicine. Um, are there certain patients that we shouldn't use allopurinol, which is really now considered the, the first choice in, in guidelines, um, um, all, all the current guidelines. This patient has CKD. Um, I think most people get kind of nervous thinking about gout and allopurinol, or rather uh, CKD and allopurinol. So we have to know how is that going to affect our prescribing. Another thing is this patient has an acute attack. Should we wait until the acute attack is over? Certainly that was uh, what I learned at the knees of all my professors, never, ever do this. This would be, you know, one of the things that might get you kicked out of, of the fellowship, right? You would never, you would never start allopurinol when somebody's having a gout attack. It's going to, obviously, it's like pouring gas on a fire. So let's, let's go through these questions. Are there medications that can be stopped? There are a few. Um, primarily, um, uh, thiazide diuretics would be the one where if you have somebody who's on that, for hypertension control and you have another agent, you can maybe switch that. And I've had the occasional patients where that actually will lower the uric acid level enough you wouldn't need to use urate lowering therapy. If somebody's on aspirin just because they think it's a good idea, you could probably stop that. However, if a doctor thought it was a good idea, I probably would say, and the guide, all the guidelines and experts would say, continue that low-dose aspirin. Are there certain patients that we don't want to use allopurinol? Uh, well, there are certain uh, drug reactions, the most uh, serious common interaction is with azathioprine. Azathioprine is, is metabolized by xanthine oxidase. Um, if you put people on allopurinol and at the usual dose, without making a change in the azathioprine, you will wipe out their bone marrow. So not a good thing. Newer thing is the recognition that there are, there are, there's a, a genetic marker that can actually help us identify patients who are at high risk for severe hypersensitivity reactions and severe skin reactions to allopurinol. Um, studies have shown this is increased in African Americans and in certain Asian populations. Um, this is uh, the uh, allopurinol hypersensitivity syndrome is, is, is a dress type of picture. It's not terribly common, as you can see. However, mortality is high. Uh, Stevens Johnson, TEN, also high mortality. So how about that CKD? Well, um, I think the biggest reason that people have been nervous about this is because of this hypersensitivity syndrome. It's been historically uh, linked with um, chronic kidney disease, but studies have shown that the um, sort of standard dosing of allopurinol based on GFR, which you can find in many um, references, 
has not been effective in preventing um, these severe reactions. And beyond that, there's been um, observational studies showing that actually lowering uric acid can improve renal function and renal outcomes, including end-stage renal disease. Um, th these are not prospective studies, but you know, there are some reasons that maybe we should actually look forward to putting our patients on um, urate-lowering therapy uh, with allopurinol. And that, that's actually reflected in the ACR guidelines, where if people have a single episode of gout and they have CKD stage 2 or more, they would recommend starting therapy. There's controversy as to the ma uh, maximum dose of allopurinol in the setting of uh, chronic kidney disease. Um, does anyone know what the uh, FDA-approved maximum dose of allopurinol is? Anyone other than a rheumatologist? 400? 600? 800? 1,000? It's actually 800. So I don't think I've ever prescribed 800. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen anybody prescribe 800. Um, but um, we can go a lot higher with allopurinol. We don't really know, though, e even people who are aggressive in treating with this uh, drug in the setting of renal disease, I think would be a little bit nervous going up to those really high doses. We don't really have the data to tell us what the maximum dose is. A final question that we were uh, considering was, should we wait until the uh, attack is over? And there's actually been a couple of well-done studies now showing conclusively, as long as you're treating for acute gout, no need to wait to start your lowering therapy. In fact, there's an advantage in doing so. You can strike while the iron hot and start that patient on um, chronic therapy while they're still highly motivated to um, not have any more gout attacks. So we've just had this conversation with the patient. He has agreed he'd like to do this. He doesn't want to have any more of these gout attacks. The typical starting dose for allopurinol is 100 milligrams daily. What these studies have shown, particularly in the patients with CKD, but just across the board, is that what we can do to reduce the chance of the um, allopurinol hypersensitivity syndrome is to start at lower doses. So when I was in training, everybody got 300 milligrams. That was just kind of a standard dose. And I still see some practitioners doing this, probably train around the same time I did, but really we should be starting everybody on these lower doses to reduce these risk. If they do have CKD4 or worse, we start at lower doses. Um, not great evidence, but again, I think just from an abundance of caution. There are certain groups um, where the ACR guidelines have recommended that we actually get this HLA uh, typing before we put people on allopurinol because of their risk. Um, there was actually a, a recent paper done in the U.S. where they actually looked at um, should we be doing this for African Americans. And they made a case based on um, cost per quality life year that, yes, we should be doing it for African Americans as well. Um, that has not yet been, I think, widely accepted by the rheumatology community, but I think that's something to think about, especially if you had a, a fragile patient and maybe a patient with... Um, CKD, um, and I wouldn't be surprised if, if the guidelines, um, the next set of guidelines will actually include this testing for African Americans as well. We always want to initiate prophylaxis for, for acute uh, uh, gout whenever we put people on urate lowering therapy. If we don't, they will be very angry because they will have lots of gout attacks. Colchicine is always the preferred drug, if possible. And following the ACR guidelines, we're going to, what we're going to do is adopt a treat to target that is a uh, serum uric acid level of less than 6 milligram per deciliter. So I actually haven't had my copy come out yet, but in this month's Annals of Internal Medicine, there's a whole series of articles from the ACR where they've actually come up with, um, I'm sorry, the, uh, the ACP has come up with their own guidelines for um, treatment of gout. And they're mostly congruent with the uh, ACR ULAR guidelines, particularly for the treatment of acute gout, acute gout, but... For chronic gout, there are differences. So the ACR, um, as I mentioned, would say if you have CKD2 or worse or past history of urolithiasis and one episode of a gout attack, you should start your urate lowering therapy. Uh, the ACP doesn't talk about, address that. They, they say, however, if you've had two attacks, you should do it. I think the most controversial part of the ACP guidelines for rheumatologists is the idea of treating to symptoms. And what the authors of the ACP guidelines said is that there's not really a high level of evidence to, for treat to target. And um, I think rheumatologists would agree with that as well. I mean, they're, they're not pros well done prospective studies saying this is really the best way to go. 
But as I'll, I'll go through the next slide, I th there is quite a bit of evidence. I think that treat to target makes sense, even though, though we don't have high quality evidence. Um, and, and so we'll uh, kind of go through that right now. One is just sort of basic what we know about gout and uh, uric acid. If you have uh, serum urate levels greater than 6.8, you're going to have uh, hypersaturation. It's going to be accumulating in the tissues. It doesn't seem like a good thing when we're trying to prevent gout. Certainly, retrospective studies have shown that if you can decrease serum urate, you have fewer clinical events. Um, treat to target or treat to goal has been an outcome in randomized controlled trials that's led to drug approval for your lowering therapy. Um, two prospective trials have shown a strong correlation between achieving target um, serum urate levels and reduction in TOFA size or elimination of TOFA, TOFI. A little bit more squishy, um, but there is evidence of benefit in lowering um, serum urate uh, levels in patients with cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease. Um, including um, reducing all-cause mortality. There's actually some ongoing studies uh, right now that are prospectively looking at populations of people who have hyperuricemia, or uh, I know there's a trial of people just, who just have type 1 diabetes where they're actually trying to say, should we be treating other groups of people um, with your lowering therapies? A bottom line, and this is um, a, you know, certainly editorial, um, but practically speaking, I'm not really sure how you would go about doing a symptom-based approach as the ACP recommends. Um, it's just really hard for me to um, figure out how you would do that. I think what we, it, would, it would look very similar to what we're doing now, which is probably under-treating people for, for long periods of time until we finally discover now you've got some joint damage or um, perhaps uh, worsening a kidney disease. So. The other problem part of the gout is the suboptimal treatment, even when we know they have it. Um, some of it is due to lack of consensus on approach to uh, when we were going to start the chronic urate lowering therapy. A big reason is poor adherence to diet and to medication. I think personally that's another reason I think uh, measuring serum urate levels would be uh, helpful so that we can make sure our patients are going to be adherent uh, with their advice or try to get them more adherent. Um, and, and, and finally, I think, and this is probably most important, is, um, you know, even though we're all wonderful physicians and work really hard and know that treating hypertension is a good thing, you know, studies have shown that we're not that very, they're not really that good at doing it. And similarly, even if you look at people who really know that we should be treating to target, the outcomes aren't that great. There have been some pilot studies just recently, though, showing that um, in a nurse-based clinic, and also in a, a different study, a pharmacist-led clinic, they had far superior outcomes in terms of um, getting urate levels to, um, to goal. So part of the future of, of controlling gout may be taking a more um, system-wide approach as um, UW Health is actually starting to do for some of the cardiovascular problems that, that our patients have. I did want to bring up a new treatment option. Uh, this is a new FDA-approved drug. It's a uric acuric. Um, it is, um, I'm sure you've probably seen the ads for it already. It is a drug which I think at best is probably going to have a niche uh, role, though. It's only approved to be used with a urate lowering therapy in patients where um, they haven't had um, success in region goal. And I, I think I already mentioned that a big part of that is that we probably are underdosing people or patients are not being compliant, and then we, we measure their, their levels and they're not good. Excuse me. The, the biggest issue with this is that it, in the studies, it did show it increased risk for um, acute kidney disease. Uh, it actually has a black, black box warning. So I think that it's probably not going to ever play a big role. There's actually um, other um, drugs that are in the pathway, I think, that, that so far look like there are going to be safer alternatives. Also want to mention a new treatment option that maybe some of you have seen. This is not an FDA-approved indication, but um, anakinra, which is an IL-1 receptor antagonist approved for gout, uh, approved for RA, rather, um, turns out can very rapidly improve symptoms of gout. Um, gout is really um, the inflammation is driven by IL-1. Um, it has an excellent safety profile, at least in the short term. It's very expensive on a, on a dose basis. It's always hard to come up with cost, but it's probably, um, you know, a few hundred dollars per dose, maybe one to three hundred dollars, depending on what your pharmacy can come up with. Um, but if you have that patient in the hospital who's lingering in the hospital because of gout and nothing else, 
Uh, this makes a lot of economic sense, and actually from a standpoint of just safety, getting that patient out of the hospital makes sense. And we've actually, um, on the rheumatology team has actually been able to get anakinra for uh, patients who are in the hospital at UW in, in that situation. So um, that was my kind of whirlwind uh, coverage of gout. This is uh, this little interlude here is from my trail cam up north. Uh, it's always kind of interesting to, to walk the trails and know that um, you're maybe not the only only uh, mammal that's been using them, especially when it starts getting dark and shadows. Um, very quickly, I'm going to go on to another patient. Um, 83-year-old, has all sorts of medical problems, comes in, new onset headache. They've got early morning shoulder aches. The astute clinician says, hmm, I'm worried about GCA. Very high set rate. Start on a high dose prednisone. Pending the biopsy results, biopsy comes back, they've got vasculitis. And now the, the physician's in a tough place, right? We've got this elderly patient who's got all these comorbidities, and now we're going to commit them to months and months of high-dose steroids. And, um, you know, I think right now there is no, uh, maybe until the last year or so, I would say there, there's really no option other than steroids. So a very bad situation for all, all, uh, all around, for the doctor and the patient. But uh, this is kind of breaking news. It came from the last um, ACR meeting. It's not yet in press. Um, Tocilizumab, which is an IL-6 receptor uh, inhibitor, FDA approved for RA, um, was shown in uh, phase two trials published last spring to be effective for um, treating GCA. Um, this phase three randomized uh, trial that was presented at the ACR was um, so significant that it actually is now in the fast track for uh, at the FDA for, to be considered for approval for GCA. Um, it is um, not only steroid sparing, but it's actually superior in efficacy. And I think it, it'll be safe to say it'll be much safer. It's also safe to say it'll be tremendously expensive. Um, I mean, really expensive. But I think it's going to be an exciting advance for uh, doctors who have to treat GCA and certainly for patients who have GCA. So I'll end there. And hopefully next time somebody gives you a, a talk on GCA, It'll be, it'll be, we'll all be celebrating the, uh, the benefits of that new drug. And this is just another, another picture from my trail cam, a little, a little less scary. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. I get to do the steel part, which is reference to surgery. I'm going to be reviewing the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, uh, going into the risks such as infections, and uh, talk to you about new recommendations for uh, surgical management or management of immunosuppressive medications uh, during surgery. I have nothing to disclose. I'm going to start with a case. This is a patient of mine who I saw in May a couple of years ago. She was doing okay, but not in full remission. She was on methotrexate and adalimumab, which is a TNF inhibitor. She complained of new neck pain. Um, X-ray showed subluxation of C C1 and C2, and she had erosions and panus formation around the dance. This is potentially dangerous. Sent her to a surgeon. It recommended surgery, but wanted to stop the Humira. Uh, she had the surgery a couple of months later, and a month thereafter, she had a terrible RA flare, which was treated with high doses of steroids. She did not see me for that. I didn't see her until December. She was still with active RA, and the surgery had failed, probably because of the intense inflammation in the neck. So the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis has changed a lot in recent years. Now we have multiple medications to choose from, and the goal is to bring the disease into remission. 
Those are the, my objectives uh, for this talk. I'm going to tell you about the treatment of RA, go into the risk of infections, and also talk about new guidelines for preoperative management. So the drugs that we have to play with when it comes to treating uh, rheumatoid arthritis are the old DMARDs with methotrexate being the most useful drug. And then we have the biologics uh, with uh, TNF inhibitors of being the most useful in, in that category. Uh, we use NSAIDs and steroids a little bit, steroids primarily to co control flares and also to get control over the disease early on, but they're not really the mainstay of treatment anymore. The goals of the treatment, the target, is full remission, which means no inflammation, no systemic symptoms, full ability, no effects on daily life. We want to prevent further joint damage and eliminate excess mortality. The ACR has come up with uh, basically flowchart guidelines how to achieve that. Um, we always begin with a single DMART, which usually is methotrexate. This would be a good reason not to choose methotrexate if you go that route. But then if people don't respond to that right away, we add medications. And it's very common that people end up on three, maybe four medications when we finally achieve control of their disease. At that time, you can start to pull back a little bit, stop medications, get rid of the, most, the riskiest ones, but you never stop treatment completely. Methotrexate as a single agent is still very useful, and it should be the first drug that people go on. Um, this is from the so-called TIER trial, where they looked at methotrexate on one side and then combination treatment with the so-called triple therapy, uh, sulfasalazine, hydroxychloroquine, and methotrexate on the other, and also methotrexate with a TNF inhibitor. I'm not going to go into that in detail, but just point out to you that on those who were just on methotrexate, about a half got significant relief of the symptoms, and 18% got full remission. So methotrexate, just by itself, is a very useful drug. If, however, it is not good enough for people, we have the option of using the so-called triple therapy with methotrexate, sulfasalazine, hydroxychloroquine, or a combination of methotrexate and a TNF inhibitor. And, but, those studies, but those two treatment approaches have been shown to be roughly equal. So people don't have to go on a biologic right away, even if they failed methotrexate. Methotrexate is, however, still underutilized. It takes about six months for it to have full effect. However, many people are switched to a different treatment after only a few months. We can go as high as 20, 25 milligrams uh, a week with methotrexate, and there is a dose-response um, correlation. Um, studies have also showed, however, that people are switched or methotrexate is stopped, even if they never tried those uh, higher doses. So doses 12 and a half, maybe 15 milligrams, and people give up on it. And that's, that's not a good practice. Methotrexate is useful. It should be used more. It should be used in higher doses. It is safe. However, we have the biologics when the DMARTs fail. And this shows you the classes of the DMARTs and where they, where they um, function within the immune system. This is the TNF inhibitors blocking TNF. We have the interleukin-6 inhibitor, the tocilizumab that Dr. McCown told you about before. We have anakinra that he also mentioned before and higher sort of up on the chain, uh, a baricept which interferes with T cell, macrophage, uh, or antigen presenting cell interactions, and rituximab which takes out B cells. So we have now tools that, that attack multiple parts of the immune system. Those powerful drugs do increase the risk of infections. Um, this looks at DMARDs on one hand and TNF inhibitors on the other, and the and the infections, they get more common the longer people stay on the, those medications, both mild infection and, unfortunately, also serious ones. Um, systematic reviews on the – there have been many systematic reviews on the biologics and infections. Some have shown increased risk. Others have not shown increased risk. But I think the general understanding and impression of people who work with those drugs is that, yes, infections are more common. But steroids also increase the risk of infections. So when you look at DMARDs, there is really not increased risk of infections overall, but if you add steroids into the mix, that's when the infection risk starts to go up. So steroids are bad, biologics, 
probably emerged not so. This is particularly challenging when it comes to surgery. Um, Preoperative evaluation of patients with rheumatoid arthritis is difficult to begin with. They do have a higher risk of coronary artery disease, but they may present in a different manner. They might be not, um, it, it, they're less likely to be identified as having coronary artery disease. Um, they're less able to perform exercise treadmill tests and so forth. Um, the cervical spine needs attention prior to surgery, and their medications may increase the risk. So what are the pros and cons of holding medications uh, prior to surgery? And this has been looked at most extensively in elective orthopedic surgery, especially hip and knee replacements. So the advantages would be that we are decreasing the risk of infection. Um, that is rare, but it can be devastating. And it's more common in people with rheumatoid arthritis than those who do not have rheumatoid arthritis. Um, other drugs, such as NSAIDs, can risk, increase risk of bleeding, and if you can get rid of steroids prior to surgery, uh, then you may promote healing. The disadvantage is, is that if you stop the medications, you are inviting trouble. You're inviting flares. And flares can happen in rheumatoid arthritis. They happen rather commonly. We typically treat them with steroids. But if you want to do that after surgery, then you really increase the risk of infections, and you add other problems, uh, medical uh, complications, high blood pressure, uh, rise in blood sugar, fluid retention, and so forth. So it's not straightforward how to treat flares if they happen shortly after surgery. Infection is more important than a flare, but the flares also matter. This has been studied. There are few uh, randomized controlled studies on holding medications. This is one on methotrexate, um, where the drug was stopped two weeks prior and resumed two weeks after surgery, um, or methotrexate continued. In the group that stopped, there were six infections. In the group that continued, there was one infection, and there were fewer flares. This is an almost identical study on luflonamide. Um, also, comparing stopping versus continuing, there were five infections where luflonamide was stopped. There, was, there were five infections uh, where it was continued, so no difference. Steroids, um, there are no randomized control studies on stopping steroids, but there is a systematic review of studies that shows that if you stop steroids abruptly prior to surgery, there is increased risk of hemodynamic instability. But giving stress dose probably does not make any difference in the outcome. So with all this in mind and several other studies, um, there was a group formed by the American College of Rheumatology and the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons that reviewed all this evidence and weighed it and came up with guidelines on what to do. So their a priori questions were, should medications be withheld prior to surgery? If so, when should you stop them? And when should you restart them? And if patients are on steroids, what should, what should you do with them? What dose should you use? So the conclusions were that in patients with rheumatoid arthritis who are undergoing hip or knee replacements, all DMARs should be continued without interruption, but biologics should be held one cycle, meaning if you have a biologic like etanercept, which is given weekly, you could do the surgery on day eight and thereafter. The medications, if they are held, should be restarted 14 days after surgery if there is good recovery. Steroids should be continued at a baseline dose. Don't try to get rid of steroids prior to surgery, and don't use stress dose. For lupus, there is less evidence, but their conclusion was that you should hold biologics but continue other medications. So those are guidelines. Those are not mandates. They have not been published yet. They may undergo some changes be before that happens. Uh, but they still need to be substantiated, even if they are uh, published and adopted. We need randomized control studies. We need data from other types of surgery, like general surgery, spine surgery. And we also need more information on other medications. So basically, my, my summary slide is that rheumatoid arthritis is treatable. Methotrexate is the most useful medications. 
Uh, most people with rheumatoid arthritis do, however, require combination treatment, but on that treatment, the risk of infection is higher. When it comes to surgery, however, you should continue the medications if the DMARDs, but hold biologic one cycle and restart in 14 days after surgery. Steroids should be continued at the baseline. So I'm going to bring you back to my patient who had this bad outcome. And this is what could have happened. Rather than the surgeon taking over the medications and not informing the rheumatologist, if I had been notified, I probably would have increased her methotrexate prior to surgery to try to bring her disease into remission because there is higher risk of flares if people are not well controlled prior to surgery. Um, I would have adjusted the medication to try to achieve the best control that I could. Methotrexate would have been continued. Humira would, be, would have been held briefly. And I'm hopeful that doing it this way, uh, the fusion would have been successful. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Jan and, and Kevin. I'll ask uh, you to come up to the, uh, the podium here and call on the audience, and please repeat the questions. Dennis? So the question is, for the patient who's had that alloperinol hypersensitivity syndrome, what are the options for your learning therapy? And, um, the option that we would go to would be the Fubuxostat. Um, there actually probably still are at some risk for that, so you'd be very cautious about doing it. Um, but that actually is, in fact, what you would do if you did find, uh, did do the HLA uh, B5801 testing and they were had that allele, then you would uh, initiate therapy with a, a Fubuxostat. And it's really a matter of, of cost. Um, so allopurinol is about $100 a year or, or less, you know, it's hard to come up with these numbers, but if you bucks stats about three thousand dollars a year. Um, if if you bucks a stat, comes down in, in price, um, that'll probably become the um, first line drug for most patients. Um, Probenicid is actually no longer in the uh, guidelines as, as a first-line agent. It's, it's a relatively weak agent um, and often difficult to use. So it it's, it's really has a very niche role. So the question is, once we've started your learning therapy, is there ever a point where we can stop it? Um, that's a conversation that, that can often come up. Um, and actually what, what happens, there's been studies of, that have informed us in this, is that eventually they will start having gout attacks again. Um, it, it really depends on basically how effective the therapy has been in reducing sort of the total body uh, burden of urate. So on average, I think the studies show that it, for people who've been on your lowering therapy at effective levels for a number of years, they might go a year or two before they start having gout attacks again. Um, so I think I, I tell people on the front end that this is going to be a lifelong therapy, um, and and uh, obviously if clinical situations change, we may we may have to consider risk benefit ratios at some point. But in general, I would consider it to be lifelong therapy. The question has to do with our experience in. Or anyone. Uh, uh, do, we, do we know uh, people coming in on a set of medications, they have a surgical procedure, and then they leave, and they're on a set of medications, uh, and they're not on the things that their doctors have been telling them for years that they should be on? Yeah, so 
basically a question has to do with uh, medication compliance and, and uh, af after surgery. I, I think it's a big question and I have no, basically no answer to it. This is something that is understudied. So I'm not exactly sure I understand the question. You're saying if a person has a gout attack when they're already on steroids? Right. So the, so the question is if you have a patient who's already on steroids for another indication like uh, transplant and they have an acute attack, would you treat with um, more steroids? And the answer would be yes. Um, actually, as I'm sure you've seen, many times uh, gout patients, complicated gout patients, which often comes down to really transplant patients, um, tend to have uh, much more severe flares. They tend to be much more long-lasting. And so, unfortunately, we often treat them with uh, higher doses for longer periods than we would uh, other patients. Joni? So the question was, are there other steroid-sparing drugs for uh, PMR, which is a disorder which is closely linked to GCA? As you know, um, there was a, a study or two on methotrexate as a steroid sparing drug in PMR, uh, the results of which um, experts in the field um, came out on both sides of, which I think tells you that it's not very strong, um, um, st strong evidence. Um, actually, at that same ACR meeting, there was also some, um, that same drug, the IL-6 inhibitor tocilizumab, actually did show uh, great efficacy for PMR. And so I, I think it's, there's a good chance it's going to be also something that will be uh, FDA approved for, uh, for PMR. Okay. So uh, Dr. Hansen is really going to make me squirm here. Um, <laughs> she's picked out about the worst possible scenario. Um, so patients were in dialysis. Um, you know, I, I, I said that, you know, for CKD, stage four, we'll start at 50 milligrams, we, and that, um, you know, we don't really um, know that, that um, dosing by GFR is going to help reduce the incidence of, of problems. But in a dialysis patient, I would probably um, start maybe even lower. Um, you know, I'd probably talk with a nephrologist, but I mean, we could even start at 50 every other day. Um, and in terms of, I, I think I would still um, aim for that uh, urate level of six or below if, if we could do it. Um, again, I would be uh, very nervous if, if we had to go up very high on the allopurinol. Um, Fubuxostat has not really been studied in severe. Um, um, at least for, for the FDA approval, it was not uh, part of the package. And I'm not aware if there's any, been any recent studies where they've looked at it in that situation. Um, I know some people feel that it might be safer in that scenario. Uh, I'm not sure that there's evidence to, to support it. Do you know of any evidence, Karen? Okay. Thanks. So the question has to do with uh, tuberculosis, latent TB, a patient with RA that is going to be starting, starting on biologic. Um, I'm not sure that there is anything new on that. Uh, I'm not aware of that any recent, recently, but the recommendations as I remember them are that, you, of course, you screen for TB. If latent TB is found, you treat that like it's commonly done with isoniazide for, for six months. And you can start treatment if there's urgent, if you need to start treatment urgently, you can start treatment into that treatment. I think it's three months into the treatment. But um, I've usually decided to wait and complete the treatment before starting a biologic.
Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question. So it has to do with how thoroughly you screen for infections prior, prior to starting immunosuppressive medications like the biologics. And we actually have a fairly clear protocol on how we do that. We do screen for TB. We do get hepatitis B, C, B and C on everybody. Uh, we try to vaccinate also uh, for things that can be vaccinated for. And if people have occupational exposures, uh, we try to look into possibility or, or other exposures. We try to look at the possibility of fungal infections, although that is not do, done, done routinely with everybody. And we try to do that even before we actually getting – we don't do it in the, in the last few days prior to going on uh, biologics. I, I try to do it fairly early in the treatment in those that I think may – be progressing towards needing a biologic uh, in, in months and years to come. So we are to try to be aware of and cognizant of the risk and, and try to minimize it. Thank you. If there are no further questions, we'll uh, conclude this Grand Rounds. I want to thank Drs. Arneson and McCown for really an outstanding uh, Grand Rounds and really lively discussion afterwards. Thank you so much.